So I got my hands on the new 14 inch M1 MacBook Pro a few weeks ago and I've been using it as my main daily driver since then. For those who follow my channel, you already know that I'm a full-time software engineer and obviously a part-time YouTuber. And to that end, this MacBook Pro in the past few weeks has been used primarily to fill those two needs. I'd say about 70% for software development, 20% for audio and video editing, and 10% for everything else. Let's find out how it has fared so far. But before we get started, let me briefly tell you about what this video will cover. First off, this will be a review primarily from the software engineering standpoint. I will briefly mention my video editing experience on it, but if you're here for silly benchmarks like Cinebench or to find out how it fares when exporting 8K ProRes video or how many FPS it musters up on Tomb Raider, you'll be disappointed. There are many other YouTube videos that will tell you those things. Like I said before, this video will focus mostly on this machine being used as a software development machine. My goal is to help you answer, is the M1 Max MacBook Pro worth buying right now as a software engineer? Well, with that aside, let's get started. So why did I get the M1 Max MacBook Pro? The first reason is the engineering behind this chip is pretty impressive. How they have condensed every important component inside a single chip to reduce latency. How they have used DDR5 memory for even faster performance or how they have opted to go with a very high bandwidth SSD similar to the ones used by the PS5 and the Xbox Series X in order to be able to swap between the SSD and the RAM depending on resource priority. Only Apple can do this. Not because their engineers are smarter than everyone else's or because they have unlimited money. Well, money helps, but because Apple controls very tightly their end-to-end -end production from hardware all the way to software. But regardless, whatever it is, it's an impressive feat of engineering. The second reason is because I have too many machines. For personal use, I already had the 13-inch M1 MacBook Pro. For video editing and music production, I have a spec'd out desktop with an RTX 2080 that some of you have probably already seen on my desk setup video. And then as a full-time software engineer, I have a Surface Laptop 4, as well as a very high-end desktop to do my day-to-day -day job. This is a lot of machines to maintain, update, and switch around. And then if I travel, I can't really edit my videos due to my desktop being at home, uh, or I always have to remote into my work desktop because it's in my office. It's just a hassle. First world problems, but problems nonetheless. So the idea that there could be one machine that could allow me to do all my work in one place and have great performance in terms of CPU, GPU, memory, battery, thermals, and completely untether me from all my clunky large desktop machines, allowing me to take all my work to wherever I travel. It was just too good to pass. But like we often say in life, things that are too good to be true generally are. So to find out whether this is just a pipe dream or actually possible, I'll be testing this MacBook Pro on C Sharp, Go, Java, Node, Python, and Rust, and pit it up against a very powerful desktop, which has a spec'd out Xeon processor with 72 gigs of RAM. I'll also build and compile a real world project to see which one fares better. But not only that, I've been using this MacBook Pro as my daily driver for the past two weeks. So I'll share my findings based on that as well. So let's start off by looking at the comparison between the M1 Max and the desktop. And after that, I will share you my experience with it as a daily driver and then give you my final verdict. For those that are interested, the code we are running as a synthetic benchmark basically allocates a long-lived binary tree to fill out the memory, then it deallocates it. While doing so, it walks the trees bottom-up, counting the nodes, allocating and deallocating them. This is simple enough that there is a fairly straightforward implementation on different languages, but at the same time intensive enough on resources for us to be able to pick out the performance disparities between these machines. We'll be going for a depth of 23 nodes for each of our runs. So I've used remote desktop to remote into my desktop and that's set up with PowerShell over here. And I've got the M1 Mac with the terminal over here. Uh, both of them have the exact same folder structures. So we've got tests for C Sharp, Go, Java, Node, Python, Rust. And I also have a real world project that I think is more representative of a real world scenario than just like running some 
one file benchmarks. Uh, but regardless, let's get started with C Sharp. Sharp, and then let's start each test in the desktop first and then see how the M1 Mac does. So let's run .NET run, and then let's give it 23 as the depth of the tree. And then do the same thing here, and let's see how well they do. It looks like the M1 Mac finished in about one minute 58 seconds, and the desktop Intel desktop did it in about 130 seconds, which is about two minutes, 10 seconds. So even on an Intel based architecture, even though it's running through Rosetta, it's still slightly ahead of the desktop. All right, let's move on to the next one, which is Go. All right, let's start with the desktop first. So Go run M1 with 23 nodes, and then do the same thing in the M1. Go run M1 with 23 nodes. All right. Let's see how this fares. All right, so the Windows machine or the desktop finished in 26.4 seconds and the M1 Mac finished in 23 seconds, so slightly ahead. All right, the next one is Java. Right, let's get started with the desktop first. So java.cp.m1 with 23 nodes. Java dash uh, Java dash with 23 nodes. All right, this is pretty quick. So if you see here, the desktop we finished in 5.5 seconds, and in the M1 Mac though, it was twice as fast as 2.3 seconds. Let's now go to Node.js. Let's start with the desktop first, node M1 with 23 nodes, node M1 with 23 nodes. All right, so the desktop completed 23 nodes in 30 seconds or 30.4, while the M1 Mac did it in just 13 seconds. That's amazing. That's like just over twice as fast. All right, let's move on. Next one here is Python. So let's run that in the desktop first as well. Python m1.py with 23 nodes. Python m1.py with 23 nodes. All right. So the desktop version finished in 101 seconds versus the M1 Mac finished in just over a minute, which is about 70 seconds. So the last one we have now is Rust before we do, we do the real world project here. Uh, let's start with the desktop first. Cargo run with 23 nodes and then do the M1. Let's see how long each of those take. All right, the M1 Mac is done. Um, in 29 seconds and the uh, desktop finally finished in 39.5 seconds. So, right, so the last comparison I want to do is what I've called a real world here because this is a real world project. Um, it's a project I used to work in. It's called WebHint. Um, the cool thing about this is it's a mono repo. So it has like a gazillion sub repos inside of it so there's a lot of building compiling copying and things like that so that will give us an indication how um, different the times are for um, the m1 mac versus the desktop or comparable desktop is in real life right of course this is not an exhaustive test but i just wanted to throw in a real world project there to see how it actually performs all right i've already installed the dependencies for this project so it's ready to be built and i'll fire both build processes and let's see which one does better This will take a while because I remember even when I used to work on this, this would take around five to six minutes. So I'm gonna speed this up. All right, so 
the M1 Mac is done at about 542 seconds. So let's note that one down, 542.89 seconds. Um, the desktop is still going on. So let's see how long that one takes. And hopefully it's not that far off, but you never know. Uh, much later, the desktop is finally done at 12 minutes, 34 seconds, which is 781 seconds total. So that's, as you can see, a staggering difference, almost like four and a half minutes slower than the M1 Max. So this is like more of a real world situation where you do something like this day to day. You aren't going to run one file that branches out a binary tree or creates nodes in the depth of 20 or 30 um, levels every single day. So as you can see, the M1 Max is easily and significantly faster than a powerful workstation with more than twice the amount of RAM. And not just in synthetic tests like Binary Tree 1, but even in a real project where it finished building and compiling almost twice as fast. My experience with video editing has also been very similar. This is twice as fast, if not more, than my i9 RTX 2080 desktop. But that being said, how this actually performs really depends on your use case. The specs are there for sure, and it lives up strongly against the hype. However, after using it for two weeks, in real life application, it hasn't really been all rosy. See, real life is much more complicated than branching out a binary tree or building one mono repo. So here's some context. I work on a very large set of distributed systems made up of over 100 microservices that get deployed to multiple regions and zones with multiple redundancies. Everything is containerized on multiple platforms, each of which can be using an array of different languages and frameworks, Node, Go, Rust, .NET, to just name a few. So when I work on a new feature or fix a bug, I need to be able to deploy all of this locally on my machine to be able to debug a very complicated inter-service communication workflow flow that involves REST calls, RPCs, messages, and so on and so forth. Not to mention, dependencies are kind of strict. I can't just install the latest version of everything to support the Apple Silicon. So I started prepping the M1 Max reluctantly. I was hopeful, but not very optimistic. The early good news is that the most popular runtimes, frameworks, and supporting tools are now running natively on Apple Silicon. The likes of Node, Go, Rust, Docker, so on and so forth. The ones that still don't run natively will still run fine in most cases via Rosetta. For example, .NET. In my case, the setup went pretty smoothly up until the point where I had to pull in my Docker images. We didn't have any images for ARM. No big deal, I can force Docker to use AMD64 images for the time being. All good. However, Docker uses QMU for AMD64 emulation, and there is a known blocking bug on QMU that prevents some .NET binaries from running on the Apple Silicon. And that's that. I can't progress any further. I just have to wait for the bug to be fixed. So why am I sharing this story? To let you know that there is a cost to being state-of-the-art. Sure. It beat my desktop at all synthetic tests and even in a real world project build. But until it works in your case, the specs and scores don't always give you the best picture. And at this point, if you work on a large complex project, chances are you'll likely run into a blocking issue. The M1 Max is a feat of engineering and an amazing piece of hardware. Heck, I have yet to hear the fans even go on and the battery lasts an entire day of development, meetings and emails without missing a heartbeat. But given the newness of the architecture, for software engineers, my recommendation is to hold off on buying it. Unless you can verify that everything you need works 100% and you have a back of machine that you can fall back to should things not work out. My guess is that in about six to 12 months, a lot of things will have caught up to being native on Apple Silicon. And at that time, this will be the machine to beat. I will definitely revisit this as a long-term review in that time frame. In the meanwhile, if you're on a specific tech stack and are hell-bent on switching to the new M1 Mac, and if you want me to set that up and try it out for you to see if it works, let me know in the comments below. If there's enough demand, I may even make a video trying out different stacks and perhaps building and running some open source projects on this laptop. If you have any other questions, feel free to ask as well. Well, that's all for today. Don't forget to like the video if you liked it and subscribe to the channel for more software engineering videos. I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.